spoke of night. He lurked in the shadows, waiting and hoping she wouldn't take a different room. This was a usual room. He knew that. He knew her. Ghost of Me, the new book by Amanda Steele, can be found at Amazon, Kobo, Waterstones, and many, many other places. Spoke of Hi guys, it's Andy N. Thanks today for downloading or streaming yet another episode of Spoken Label. As you may or may not be aware, Spoken Label was started in the beginning of 2006, and currently we have well over 150 sessions recorded to then sent. Although you can find it on various networks, the full archive is available for streaming and downloading at Spoken Label full stop bandcamp.com it is a free download or free stream in there but obviously if you feel like chucking me a few pennies that way it'd be eternally grateful to help me keep this podcast going and keep improving my equipment etc enjoy speak to you soon bye bye spoken label hi guys and the end spoken label back in the house after I've done something today, and we're chatting to a lady at the moment, um, Michelle Cox, where she's um, a novelist that's done doing a series. So I've done something today here, and I'm, I've just impressed Michelle with this. The fact is I've managed to read all five of her novels in this series in about a month, and that's good going for me, so I'm not that quick a reader. So, Michelle, seriously, would you like to introduce yourself to everybody? Tell them obviously where you are. And what led you into your creativity? We'll start from there. Great. Okay. Well, thanks for having me on, Andy. I really appreciate it. Uh, As you mentioned, I write the Henrietta and Inspector Howard series, which is a sort of mystery romance series set in the 1930s in Chicago. So it's, I like to call it, it's kind of a Downton Abbey meets Upstairs Downstairs or Miss Fisher's Murder Mysteries. Yeah, kind of definitely, definitely. Okay. And then, anyone that knows your genre, it most definitely is that. <laughs> okay, perfect. Good. I'm glad I got it right. Yeah, so, my, my mum is a massive fan of Upstairs, Downstairs, the original yes. the, the, the original one, not the remake. Yes. And I was talking to her about this series, and I'm going to have to go and buy them for a birthday next year. I know I am already. Oh. But she turned around and said to me, it most definitely does sound like Upstairs, Downstairs. Do, 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 do. <laughs> Thank you. That's a huge compliment. Um, I loved the original version too. I mean, the remake was good, but you just can't beat the original. So no, I know. So we're, we're digressing, aren't we? So tell us, oh, sorry. tell people, yeah, <laughs> we're going to be a lot of this today. So and I know what I'm like, and I think I know what you're like as well, Michelle. Yeah. So obviously, what led you into your creativity originally, then, and what's the journey to this series of novels? Um, is this a good question? Um, you know, I, I always loved to to write stories, but I, um, growing up, I used to write like little fan fiction of Louise and the Alcott books before I knew what that was. Um, but I never thought they were any good. Uh, and so as time went along, I kind of toyed with either being a writer or being a doctor. Ah. So I thought that being a doctor actually would be easier. (laughs) Turns out it's probably true. Um, So I did pursue that for a while. And then halfway through uh, college, I decided this is, you know, as as interesting as I thought science and calculus and all of that was, um, it really wasn't my passion. And so I switched to uh, English literature. Uh, Notice I still didn't have the courage to do creative writing. Uh, And I ended up working at, in a nursing home, which had nothing to do with my degree. <laughs> but um, anyway, I got married, I had kids, I was a stay home mom, and the whole idea of writing just sort of went out the window. But I was always a really creative person. So that was always kind of trying to come out in some way. And um, whether it was, you know, gardening or decorating the house or whatever there was many you know ways that that was trying to come out and it wasn't until probably about 2012 um when my oldest was diagnosed as a sophomore in high school with uh, adhd and then the second kid i'm like well, there's something wrong with him too it actually turned out he there wasn't but so i kind of went into this like big like you know flurry of um you know, I need to quit all these volunteer things I was doing and all these committees that I was on and just like stay home and, 
you know, get these kids on track. And that didn't take as long as I thought it was going to take. And so then I had all this time on my hands and I'm like, you know, you could restart your career or you could go back to volunteering or maybe you should write the book that you always wanted to write. The, I like that word, the book. <laughs> <laughs> So I knew nothing about writing a novel. So I had actually Googled, literally Googled how to write a novel. And I came up with this snowflake method, which I don't use anymore. But I wrote this book and then I spent about a year trying to shop it and nothing happened. And eventually I just put that to the side and started over. And that led to the Henrietta and Inspector Howard series. Brilliant. Now, yeah. I want to talk about each book because because I want to I want to learn a bit more about how your approach to writing changed, and I will. Because we've got we've got to start this <laughs> this series today. Now, but obviously, the first book then was obviously a girl like you. Now, obviously, you can. This is when I did a review of this one on my book review podcast, and I'll send the link over to this afterwards because mm. it stunned me in a way. This in a good way and really good way was the sheer vividness of this book, and it was like. It almost like you'd actually step back into time, into all that. And I said you were doing all the the corner bars and the taxi dancers. I had to double check some of these references out afterwards. So it felt like to me, I thought, where's the where is the source material come from? This bit because it's just so vivid. But I can see from reading your bio, you've always had an interest in this sort of history, haven't you? Yes, exactly. Yeah, I really have. Um, I've always had a sort of penchant for the past and especially the really the 40s. But now, you know, with the, the series, I've sort of uh, pushed my interest into the 30s as well. Yeah. So tell us about that. And obviously, um, the, why, uh, where Henrietta came from as a character, then I'm going to talk about Inspector Clive in a minute. Then, right? Yeah, well, that's a great question because Henrietta is actually based on a real person that I met. Oh, and, wow. Yeah. yeah, so when I worked in the nursing home, I worked on the, the, a nursing home for um, Bohemian. It was originally an orphanage um, and a home for the aged. It was a, That was its original title. Um, so there was a lot of Czech Bohemian people, but then there were, you know, people from all over Chicago there. Um, but they had these amazing stories of what it was like in their sort of prime, they were living in Chicago in, in the thirties and forties. And that's kind of, you know, for later on, that's kind of where the blog comes from too. But this, when I was kind of looking for an idea, you know, I'd started over my first book didn't go anywhere. And I thought, you know what, I just need a little kernel of truth, a little idea. And so I looked through all of the stories that I had, had amassed from the nursing home. And this wow. woman's story really kind of floated to the top because she had this extraordinary life in Chicago. And she was this, uh, apparently this bombshell. She used to tell me that she had a man stopping body <laughs> once upon a time and a personality to go with it. Wow. Like, oh, that's kind of a cool person. So wow. All of the all of the crazy jobs, you know, you referenced a taxi dancer and, and and all of the jobs that Henrietta has in book one, this woman actually had. Wow. So yeah, and that's why I said the book in the 30s as opposed to the 40s, is because she had this job at the World's Fair where she was this Dutch girl, where she would dress up like a Dutch girl and walk around and pass out flyers. And I thought that was such a neat detail. I really wanted it yeah. to be in the book. And I thought, well, this is just a one-off book. I can write one book in the 30s. But then as I was writing, I thought, oh, my God, I, I don't want to leave these characters behind. So, oh, so I got to the halfway stage in that and I began to realize. No, it's because yeah. obviously I knew there was other books out anyway to follow it. And I thought to myself, it felt like you were just a one-off book to begin with. got to halfway, so I could see it. When she went yes. to work in the second club, I thought, no, Michelle's going to want to carry this series on and on and on. Exactly. I really, I, I, but I needed to change the story just a little bit to continue it on. But yeah, and I thought, okay, I'll make this into a series. But I had a little moment of panic because I thought, oh my God, <laughs> now I have to write a whole series set in the 30s. Um, but it's turned out to be um, really good because... Uh, it's kind of a forgotten era between the two wars so that we've, you've got a ton of books out there about world war two, 
lot coming out now about World War One, and so this is kind of that little in between period, and I, um, it's not so heavily written about. So I'm glad now that that I said it there. Yeah, yeah, you could tell that straight away. So yeah, now I don't want to give too much spoilers away. Obviously, of meet you books because, but obviously, um, where did Cl- Inspector Clive come from? Uh, Howard. Well, did now he he's completely made up. So I, I was, was wondering not... if he was made up. <laughs> I wonder whether the woman that be based Henrietta on, whether she had a secret or the husband or something. No, <laughs> no, she didn't. No, I had to, well, I had to make, here's the thing. When I started writing, um, because I was such a newbie, I didn't realize what, what genre I was writing in. And because this book crosses lots of genres, some people think of it more of a mystery, which is how I bill it. But, you know, it's won a lot of romance awards. It's won a lot of historical fiction awards. So different people see it differently. And when I was writing it, they say, you know, write what you would like to read. And so this was it. But if I had known more than when I started, I probably would have um, stuck more to one genre and followed those rules <laughs> instead of just trying to like blend them all. So yeah. I really so, wanted- So do 200, stick to one. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. So I wanted this sort of uh, mysterious kind of older kind of jaded detective who would fall in love with Henrietta and, you know, we would go from there. So, yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's a fantastic book. Well, the series is really good. So, but the first one that is, it was a case of staggered me at the actual, the, the net day clubs and stuff like that. Did you have to do a lot of research on the clubs, did you, back then? The corner miles well, and the... Re- the where Henrietta ended up going into the big mystery. Well, I did live for about 10, 10 to 15 years in Chicago. And so um, some of these places I've actually been to, like the Green Mill, and um, some of them are, are made up. Um, I sort of did a mix. So I, I think that I just have an eye for detail. So, I, you know, I, I've, you know, spent so many years like storing these details. But also some of it is just based on on true eyewitness accounts from all of these old people I interviewed. And then um, there's also a lot of online, um, like almost like some of the neighborhoods in Chicago have their own online historical sort of um, vaults. And so you can do a deep dive into some of these neighborhoods and there's lots of pictures and um, newspapers and all kinds of things that you can explore. So that was really fun too. Yeah, I think it helps nowadays with the internet, really, doesn't it? Because it gives you the option, basically, if you can do research that way instead of going spending hours and hours in libraries and stuff. No, I get it completely with that. Now, obviously, uh, that's the first book in the series. Now, I want to talk to you about the other ones as well, because because obviously people are wondering, there is five of them so far. Now, what I'm interested in knowing is, um, before we go into our discussion book two, is when you actually wrote book one, you said you'd obviously you knew what to do as a series. Did you have the five books in mind at that end of the first book? Did you or did I take a bit more planning beyond that? No. And in fact, you know, I still don't know where the series is going to end. I'm writing book six right now. So um, the only thing that I plan is that I I don't end one book before I know how the next one's going to begin. Because it's almost like then I'm just setting it up. So in terms of where I see it going, I really only plan one book ahead and then go from there. Yeah, that makes sense. Makes sense because I thought I can imagine it if you planned, say, five, six books in advance. By the time you got to the fifth book, they would completely change <laughs> what you started it off on. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Oh, completely. Now, I found it really interesting when you actually changed gears. The second book's a change in gears, really, but it's a natural change in gears. We went to the Ring of Truth where, because obviously people can look at the blurb and we can say that straight away, because Henrietta meets Clive's family in the second book. And then then it's like a clash of cultures, really. But obviously there's a mystery in it, but it's a different sort of mystery. Now, on that one, was that always the plan then, was it, for her to meet Clive's family then pretty early on for the second book? Yeah, because like I said, midway through, I, I realized I was going to have to shift, gear, shift gears because I couldn't, I didn't really want to write um, a, a mystery series, a, just a straight up mystery series set in Chicago, like the gritty underbelly of the city, 
and it's just you know a cop and his wife I, I felt like that had been done before and it it wasn't something that particularly appealed to me so I really kind of wanted some to write something more Downton Abbey-esque <laughs> there we go yeah. so yeah. I yeah, you, had can to see, make... you can see it but it's got your voice in it the second book definitely <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So I I felt like somebody had to have a secret past. And so Clive stepped up <laughs> and <laughs> said, uh, I'll do it. So he it ha- is the heir to this very wealthy estate on the North Shore. And as you said, it's a great setup because then you do really have this sort of clash of cultures. And it's something I felt like I could expand upon because that's one of the th- one of the you know points of the great depression is that you had all of these super wealthy people and then you had all of these other people who are just like destitute so i really wanted to look at that and um and i think that i achieved that but <laughs> it hopefully the reader enjoys being in that world people have told me when they read it it's almost like you're living in some sort of fantasy or fairy tale world and that's really fun to be in and but then you come down out of that and there's all of these real characters like Stan and Ma and Elsie who are living in in on the other part and that's interesting too so yeah and I will talk about Elsie as a character in, in a bit separately cuz cuz right. I've noticed her journeys radically changed gears in the last certainly books four and five but we'll come on to that in a bit definitely so but like yeah yeah no straight away you can see it and it made me actually and i'll tell this in the book, book review podcast in number two i loved the the first part of it book two but then i gave it changed i felt you were pining for the characters like the uh, henrietta's family i was glad i was great to see them all in the second half of the book so did you find yeah. when you're doing that book did you find that oh I'm missing like her sister Elsie and brother, younger brother Eugene, and you brought them to the engagement party. Well, you know, I, I part of that book is actually a little bit of a ripoff of um, Pride <laughs> and Prejudice. <laughs> <laughs> honestly, honestly, it's a good job that's there. We can't get sued then. <laughs> 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 exactly. So, yeah, I wanted this setup where, you know, you've got these two characters who are clearly, you know, have this chemistry and um, they just can't seem to completely, um, you know, agree to terms. And so you have them, you know, just like Elizabeth Bennett, Bennett sort of like, you know, marches off, leaves, his, leaves Darcy. And then when, you know, Lydia, the younger sister, goes missing, she has no choice but to go back to Darcy and ask for his help. And so I really pretty much modeled this book on that where, you know, they separate and then something happens with Henrietta's brother. And then she feels like she has to apply for his help. And then, you know, it sort of goes from there. Yeah. That is what's been really good is I would go on to the third book next, because each of your books really to me is very, very different. And then obviously we went into book three, and that's when obviously we had the marriage where promise given and they went over to England and then they started going to places very near to where I live actually so it's like <laughs> see that's what impressed me and I thought oh wow I thought, this is another change of gears but have you actually been to England before then have you or I have so I was this uh um an exchange student as a junior so I spent six months in London but then I um Many years later, I actually married somebody from Liverpool. Ah, so, that explains why then, because we're in Manchester, and Manchester's only about 15 miles, 20 miles away from Liverpool, so that explains why. <laughs> yes, and we've gone twice now to, to Chatsworth, which I just think is the most beautiful place on earth. Oh, and it's so, amazing on there, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and we just, we've had a couple of really amazing vacations there, so <laughs> I really wanted to set it in, in that area. Really, I was. I must admit, I was wondering, well, where is this knowledge of England come from? I thought I didn't know your whole, obviously your husband was obviously his Liverpudian, and like it was like, so did he prove your buffer? Then did he in the third book? Then did he with your as for the research? Yes, you know he reads um, every book. You know he's one of my beta readers, and he's great because um, he he'll say, oh, you know somebody in England wouldn't say this or he'll, he'll correct the dialogue. And actually his brother read the books too. And he was very good at um, catching 
things that, you know, as an American, you wouldn't think like, I think I had in the book, the, the pub that they go to is the um, horse and coach, but I had written it as the coach and horse. Uh, and yeah, it, would be, it would be the horse and coach straight away because it's the way right. they do them in England. It's just, you just don't know, do you? Like, no, like, no, I would never have known that. So that's yeah, what, I had the that's two what good sometimes readers. If, you, if you've got beta readers that are pointing things out to you like that, because it is like, I think, uh, tell me if you agree with this one. I think when you're writing in other countries, there's a problem sometimes you can trip yourself up the name about realizing. And I think you've not done it, and that's obviously because your husband's probably point and his brother's pointing things out to you. And it's give it a really, really good feel in the third book completely when they came over. Thank you. I appreciate that because that, that you're right. It is very hard to do. And I felt like I could maybe pull it off in England because I'd spent so much time there, but I think it would be really difficult to do that in any other country. No, you did a great job on it straight away. So now on the fourth book, then I'll come on to the fourth book. Now, see, look at this now. This is my knowledge today. I'm really good at this. <laughs> I'm double getting the titles <laughs> off, your book, off your website and then I can ask you questions about them. Now, I like the fact in the fourth book, and I'm doing this off the blurb, so I'm not giving anything too much away for you, okay? But sure. a bail removed is where, obviously, Clive's father, unfortunately, sadly passed away, and they had to come back to Highbury, where Clive's school was always not what should be. Now, I found this one, this book, like the fifth one, was a bit of a change in gears, really. Because obviously, then, then we started finding out more about the story of Elise, didn't we? Right. And Riesa's sister. Now, what made you want to start bringing her into the series more, then? Because we start seeing different viewpoints in the fourth and fifth book, and I found that quite interesting. Yeah, um, it's a good question. I, I, I feel like Elsie is this character that was never supposed to be more than a bit character. And um, you probably can relate to this as, a, as an author. People would, you know, I would hear authors talk about this before I was a writer, like, oh, my character spoke to me, or oh, they wanted to do whatever. And I would think, oh boy, you know, how ridiculous. <laughs> But that is kind of what happened with Elsie is I just, um, she just seemed like part of it, I'll be honest, was that uh, now that Clive and Henrietta are married, and I still try to kind of keep their romance going, but we need, the reader needs a new romance, you know? Yeah. So then the the candidate was, was Elsie. So I kind of had to bring her... Um, role more in focus and by the time we get to the fifth book she has as much playing time as Henrietta yeah she and, most definitely um, does definitely does yeah yeah it's definitely a split book and there are I do have a lot of readers actually who have contacted me to say that they actually prefer the Elsie storyline <laughs> oh wow <laughs> Like, really? Okay. <laughs> really? <laughs> so maybe I will spin her off into her own series. Well. I was just going to ask you that. Or is, or is Eugene going to get his own spin off series? Maybe. <laughs> Who knows? Now, obviously, Eugene, obviously, we need to. I'll, I will ask you about him because he's been in the background for a little bit, I've noticed now, out of yes. out of the equation. And that's all I'll add. I'm not going to ask you what you planned you got forward for him. But obviously, like, tell us about the creation of both uh, brothers, okay, the nearest two siblings then. Eugene and Elsie. Then, where where did these both these characters come from? I, you know, I don't know exactly. Um, Eugene didn't, you know, originally start off to be the baddie, but he kind of took on a little bit of that role because I needed somebody to do that. Um, and Elsie, like I said, she developed because I needed somebody else to kind of take on that romance role. And I've thought for a long time that I, well, Eugene does come back for a little bit in book four, but I need, um, I've thought about bringing him back as a bigger role at some point. It's kind of like at this point, I feel like I'm the director of this mini series. It, it feels like a movie in some ways, doesn't it? Yeah. So <laughs> and, I was going to be, I'll going to ask you in a bit, and I'll give you two minutes to five minutes notice on this, but dream yeah. casting, we'll, we'll come on to that later. <laughs> well, oh, no. <laughs> Yeah, but seriously, no, yeah. like, go on, back to what you said, yeah. Dreams, you? I, yeah, it's kind of like, you know, if I'm this big director of a, of a mini series, not every episode can be about every character. So it's like every character can't be in every book because that would, they're already too huge as they are. Yeah, but, you've got, um, perfectly got yeah. a massive cast like you have. It's yes. like, it's, you can't bring them in every day because you've got 
people read the book, is the books develop, you get the cast starts, the world opens up, you get more and more people coming into it. Right, exactly. So, you know, you've got Stan and he's, you know, spun off a little bit into his own like strange things going on. And I had to have a new comic character. Stan used to be the comic character. So I have Melody Mary. I, re- I really liked him actually in the first, the first yeah. book particularly. I felt it was one of these sort of guys I've known blocks like him. Thick as two planks, but the hearts and the hearts and the sleeve. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And he's actually based on, he's not based on a real person but this woman that i you know based henrietta on Hmm. she had this reputation in her neighborhood of being a very good girl even though she was very beautiful and voluptuous and she had all of these strange sort of sleazy jobs um but she had this reputation of being a, a good girl and so these this gang of boys in her neighborhood knew this and they would wait for her to get off the L or the trolley or the bus very late at night and they would follow her secretly at a distance until she made it home safely. And I just thought that was such a neat detail that I really yeah. wanted to put that in, but I couldn't and write this got, gang. I knew, I knew that had to come from somewhere. That was definitely a yeah. historical fact to me straight away. And I, I'm glad, I'm glad yeah. you asked that because I felt it was over here. Obviously, like I said it was hints of a number of lads, wasn't there? So it was a well liked young lady, basically, a beautiful, well liked young lady <laughs> for that one. Right. So, yeah, yeah, perfect. Now, um, I want to ask you next about obviously on the, your current book, the fifth book, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get the name for it now. This is um, A Child Lost. There felt like there was a lot more research done in this book because. And then once it gets to the end of the book, you can see there's several pages of notes and acknowledgements on it about the hospitals and the colleges there, basically. So did you find them, was this the most trickiest book at the service to write so far, then, was it? In that, in that regards, yes, because um, I did do a lot of extra research um, on the Dunning, the, the insane asylum, and then also the college that... Um, Elsie attends, which is my alma mater. So it was fun to write about my college when it would have been a brand new school. So yeah, it did take a lot of research. A lot of it was really interesting um, to do. And it was also the most challenging book for me because normally I have two sort of main plot lines running. And in this book, I decided to try to juggle three. Yeah, I yeah. spotted the three, and I thought myself, yeah, I yeah. Thought, so it was tricky, but I think I, I think I pulled it off. Yeah, he did a good job. Did a really good job on it, and it was um, it made me think of a lot because when I mean, you talk about the asylum, asylum, asylum bit in it, in the centre of Manchester where we are, there was an asylum right in the centre of it, and mm-hmm. and it was people then putting these asylums at the time for epilepsy. Yes, right. Yeah, yeah exactly. And, and you it's all kinds of stories of what's back then. It's it's just some of the story it's worth researching anybody, serious listeners tonight. I know of stories where people basically got put in an asylum for turning somebody down and wanted to marry them. Yeah, I that know. Was Isn't it awful. Yeah. It oh. was not it wasn't a people where people weren't mad, they were just from after was just unlucky, or they couldn't deal with the health conditions. Right, exactly. There were so many people in asylums that should never have been, and there was nothing they could do. Which is such no. a tragedy. Yeah, no, it's definitely so. As I said, it's it's the most book I, I could see. I knew straight away that, that would took some work. That book definitely straight away to write. So. Yeah, <laughs> and did did. You find, um, did you find? Did you envisage when you first started that book then that you, you knew that one would take more work? And or not? No, that's the wrong question. Not more work. A different way of working to the previous four books. Yeah, you know, it did. I, I knew it was going to be a challenge. And actually, I, it, I had an added challenge in that, um, you know, I'm, I'm trying to, because right now I do not have a literary agent. And so I'm, that's kind of my next um, goal. And I knew that the series it's not going to be picked up by a separate publisher than I already have or a separate agent. Um, So I needed to create something new to be able to shop for an agent. So I wanted to keep the series going, but I knew I also had to write this other book. So it was a triple challenge to write a child lost because I only gave myself three months to write it. Do you write that short? Wow. (laughs) Three months to write the first draft, 
three months to edit it. And then the next three months of that year to write the first draft of a different book and then three months to edit it. So wow. it was very grueling. <laughs> yeah. I had to really set a daily word, you know, count that I had. Yeah. To. I was going to say to you, do you have to do that then? That's all, that's all you get, that's all discipline. That's when you, you're writing it. You really have to focus, don't you? Yeah. And I know you people wonder, you know, you've told me already, you've got, I know you've got two children. So you've got a sign outside your study door, mummy writing, do not disturb. <laughs> well, it's funny. I don't have that. I, but I do actually, I do have a sign out there right now that says um, live podcast, don't enter. <laughs> so I have oh. different signs that I put up, which <laughs> tell them, you know, don't come in before whatever reason. So, yeah. Brilliant. I can't blame you there. Now, I want to talk about the future anyway, but obviously, before we get to that, I want to talk to you, obviously, make sure we touch base on this, because I'm really, I've been really reading, reading some of your your blog you've got going at the moment, a lot of novel notes of local law, which is obviously a weekly blog that dedicated to Chicago's forgotten residents. Now, yeah. where did this idea come from? It's a fantastic blog. I've really been enjoying this. Oh, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, that it came from the, um, those are all the stories that I collected from the nursing home. So I have kept the very, very best, most special ones um, to turn into novels. Of course. <laughs> but those are just um, real stories. I mean, they're the, I do change the names, but otherwise they are absolutely true. Everything in the, in the blog happened. And I just, find that you know truth is stranger than fiction like some of this stuff you couldn't make up with these yeah, people yeah. so no. I think it's a great tribute to them and it it's the blog has really exploded it actually has its own following separate from the books <laughs> <laughs> which is great but you know I think it kind of I, I've tried to rationalize this like why and I just think that it's because there's there's short snippets and that's what people like to read yeah, you've we said that before, didn't we? I can't remember said it off mic. But uh, people nowadays their attention spans less. So people do seem like like flash fiction. In this case, it's flash fact, and it's so. <laughs> yeah, no, I get you. I get you, but it's brilliant. It's well worth reading that, Jim. Michelle's blog everyone in that straight away. So now um before there's a question I forgot to ask you before as well, before we come on to what's next, is I want to talk about your approach of your five novels. Have you found in over these this writing this series? Has your approach to your writing actually changed? Uh, yeah, it has a lot um, in lots of different ways. Um, I, you know, the first book was a lot easier because it's really dealing with two main characters and, you know, and the bad guy. And so as I've gone along, I've had to really stretch in terms of being able to juggle so many characters and plot lines running um, at the same time. And, you know, we sort of touched on this a little bit while back about book four kind of being a departure. And I would definitely agree with that because books one through three are kind of their own little trilogy. And I, they kind of just came out that way without, you know, too much forethought. And then by book four, I thought, okay, now I really have to make a decision about where this is going. And so that was a little bit harder to write because I think felt like I had to really focus more on the mystery because I feel like I was straying a little bit from that. So four was an attempt to go back to a real mystery and then five followed from that. But I also feel like um, in writing these two other standalone novels and I've employed some pretty high level editors to help me <laughs> I was wondering how the thumbs up there, right? Definitely. Yes, right. Yeah. <laughs> to try to get them, you know, to to be ready to show, you know, and to shop to to various agents and big publishers. Um, so I've I've been, you know, going back and forth and back and forth with edits, and that has also changed, you know, the way I sort of think about a book because with these books, I had, I had a lot more latitude to do what I wanted to do. But if you're trying to write for a traditional publishing house, it, 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 it's almost like it has to have a thriller pace, whether it's a thriller or not. <laughs> yeah, even if it's a thriller or not, yeah, you've got to keep that. Yeah. The expe you've got to follow the expected guidelines. Oh, la, 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 la. Yeah. Yes, yeah. right. 
So even though these two new books are not mysteries, they're more just historical women's fiction, they have to have that sort of pacing and, you know, just a lot of other, you know, um, things that they want or don't want. And so that I'm writing book six right now with a series and it's kind of messing me up a little bit because I have too much now in my head. I, I couldn't do that pace. <laughs> no. I'm, I'm really a poet. I, I, I said oh. before to my lady, my lady's a novelist and I've seen what projects she's got in the go at the moment. And it's like, <laughs> I have that. Well, uh, I but, have the utmost respect for poets. Honestly, I'm not just saying that because I feel like that is the hardest challenge out there is to try to express a complete thought in such a, a limited amount of words. That, yeah. That's incredible. I'm always believing my poetry because I can tell, do the story I want to tell in poetry. But I saw everything. I've done five books now. And I've got a sixth one on the way myself. Wow. But each one is radically different to the previous one because I'm going different directions all the time. So it's like like yours. It's I think as the gears get going, you're writing you push yourself more and more because I think you find your voice over time, don't you? So, yes. And that's why in your case, you've got two more novels. In the middle, which I knew there was one. I didn't know there was two. When I thought, oh. yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah. How, how far into book six are you at the moment then of Henrietta and Howard? Well, I'm probably about 40,000 words in. So oh. this one, they're, they go back to um, Europe and they are now... Um, on an expedition to Alsace Lorraine. And Very they nice. Are looking for a hidden relic that Hitler is also looking for. Very nice. So, obviously, we're not going to give them the plot away, but um, what's been your research in this book? Is that is that an area you've been to, or is it something you have to do a bit of research on? I have had to do a bit of research, and that's sort of ongoing. Um, I picked it because Henrietta, if you go back in, I think, book one, it lists that she is from Alsace-Lorraine, and also my family, there's a branch from Alsace. So, But the real research is having to research, um, you know, what Hitler was looking for, these relics of power, and all of these crazy things that, you know, I didn't realize <laughs> he had sent out all these expeditions and, you know, you think the Indiana Jones in the temple of doom is like, you know, a fake thing, but actually some of it is based on true. Yeah. I was just I was about to mention those sort of swashbuckling Indiana, Indiana Jones things. And yeah. it's been interesting. The series has gone on a long, long, because the fifth book in particular, there was a direct mention of Hitler a few times in it. And that's why it's like, I think when you started off in the mid thirties, Hitler was in power. So then, right. like, as the series develops, you can then slowly bring it into things more, can't you? So, and yes. have right. the real world touching on their, your little fictional bubble, basically, and see how it blows up. So, oh, brilliant. Yes. Okay, well, that's pretty well covered all my questions today, Michelle. So Wonderful. But, we'll let you conclude now. Give, give us the hard plug. If people want to find out more about you, where are the best going? Well, you can go to my website, which is michellecoxwrites.com. And there you can find um, all of my social media links if you want to follow me. Um, there's audio book clips. All the books are out on audio if you don't have time to read. And if you do go to my website, I highly encourage you to sign up for my newsletter because um, I do these huge giveaways every couple months where I put together a big package like an iPad, a set of books, um, you know, luxury luggage or a scarf or jewelry or wow. whatever it is <laughs> wow. yeah and wow. one one lucky subscriber wins so yeah sign up and to to be a winner and then you also you know can keep track of what i'm up to so brilliant well yeah. good luck good luck with your, your forthcoming two books michelle and Thank you very much. obviously as well and um, we look forward to him book six and i'm not going to ask you when it's out because like i said it's and i if, it, if you were you're writing it the way you've been writing book five I anticipate it be out later on this year, but you never know. <laughs> you never know. We'll see. <laughs> we'll see, yeah. Particularly yeah. there's other things on the go at the moment. So I might get I'm writing guessing at the moment then, where your writing days just quickly before we finish. Is like, do you have like a certain amount of time you're writing every day and then dealing with a lot of the correspondence queries all the time now then? Yeah, I, I, I do about an hour, an hour and a half every morning. I have to write first thing because that's when my, my brain is the crispest. So I write for, like I said, an hour, hour and a half, and then pretty much I do six to eight hours of, you know, like you said, correspondence, marketing, 
that kind of stuff. So. Yeah, I think you have to. Like I said, it's way, ways of writing. I don't know my partner Manu does that. I tend to write last thing at night. I'm the other way around. Really? <laughs> yeah. Okay. I mean, I do it when I'm winding down, but the music particularly, yeah, I said, it is. It is so. <laughs> but I don't Michelle. Well, let you, let you scoot off now. So it's been brilliant. I've really enjoyed this. Wonderful. So, Thanks, Andy. Then a pleasure. So, right, as Don Callis says, everybody from Impact Wrestling, stay safe and stay over. And we'll see you all soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Spoken, mate.